Well, welcome to this uh, interview. Uh, this oral history records Dr. Swanchevsky's contributions that resulted in his invention of the magnetic tunnel junction, as well as understanding of spin torque transfer phenomena. The invention of the magnetic tunnel junction is especially noteworthy because it enabled the commercialization of the third generation of magnetoresistive heads used in all modern hard disk drives. Well, we'll get started, John. Okay, thank you, uh, Chris. <coughs> uh, why don't you start by telling us about your family background, <laughs> where you were born, uh, I, examples of where you grew up, and what schools you attended. <laughs> yes, well, all right. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, born in New York, and uh, mm, uh, to Polish uh, parents. Uh, they were ethnically Polish, even though uh, my father was not uh, born in Poland. He was born in Switzerland. <clears throat> and I won't uh, go too far into his story because his life story is extremely complicated. But in the end, he, uh, he was, as a youth, lived in Brazil and then came to uh, the United States and enrolled at uh, the Cooper Union in New York and became an engineer and had a very successful career at the uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories. Mm. Uh, and my mother had a, uh, <clears throat> has a simpler life but, um, but rather dramatic because at age 21 she left her village in, uh, in Poland <clears throat> And, and arrived in New York City. And at, when she arrived, she was informed that the quota for polls for that year was filled, and so she could not be admitted into the United States. Um, but then um, she did something quite dramatic. She escaped from Ellis Island and spent the next uh, 15 years. <laughs> First, she got married. <clears throat> and had two uh, sons, myself and my brother George. And uh, <clears throat> after 15 years of uh, living illegally in the United States, she decided well, she wanted to become a citizen. And so uh, she learned that she had to go back to Poland and uh, re-enter in a legal way. And then she, uh, so she took my brother and me uh, to, to Poland. I was seven years old <clears throat> and uh, thinking that um, she spent the summer there as a summer vacation that she could uh, <clears throat> uh, then enter in a legal fashion. But there was a lot of red tape with her application for immigration uh, because of her history. And so we spent actually eight months in Poland. And so I had the pleasure of attending the first grade of school in Poland. And, um, and uh, the, my memories of those days are really very vivid, much more vivid than my memories of New York when I was a little child. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, Upon returning from uh, from Poland, uh, we did eventually move to Long Island, <clears throat> and I lived on the north shore of Long Island and attended public schools there. Uh, so um, I also took violin lessons, and uh, as a youth, I imagined I would become a a violinist, but uh, uh, my lack of skill uh, <laughs> uh, pushed me in other directions. My father was very interested in physics <clears throat> and, uh, and communicated his enthusiasm to me. And so it was one of the early uh, um, impulses, uh, early influences which uh, led me to uh, uh, have an interest in uh, uh, science, uh, particularly mathematics and physics. 
were there other career, potential career interests be besides uh, violin and mathematics uh, in your youth? Yeah, I had, uh, it was a time of uh, World War II and uh, I had some sort of enthusiasm for being a naval, uh, <coughs> naval commander, but uh, that was very, very, um, um, very unrealistic and uh, uh, and did not really influence me in a in a real way. So uh, <clears throat> uh, on completing my high school studies in uh, on Long Island, I went to uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. <clears throat> uh, and uh, majored there in, in physics. Uh, on completing that, um, I was a little bit disgruntled with physics because um, uh, the, the kind of quantum theory I was taught there was the old Bohr theory, which was <clears throat> not, very, not very satisfying. Uh, uh, and uh, so, that led me to, to switch my major to mathematics at Rutgers University. Uh, but after one year at, uh, in mathematics, I decided I could never really be a mathematician. And so I switched back to physics. And then I learned uh, physics, the, the quantum theory, in the correct way based on the work of Schrodinger and Heisenberg and so on. And also uh, solid state physics, which uh, de <clears throat> determined my, my subsequent career, really, yes. Uh, what was the focus of your uh, doctoral uh, thesis? Oh, my thesis was on the band structure of graphite. And um, in that work, I, I took the band structure of graphene, the single layer of graphite, and uh, from that I projected what the band structure would be of the three-dimensional uh, graphite. So it was rather the opposite direction of the modern interest because people, uh, <laughs> because the, um, the properties of graphene itself are now much more exciting than the properties of, of a graphite. <clears throat> but still, that, that paper that I wrote uh, on my PhD thesis uh, has been very well received, and it's actually the second most, uh, most uh, referred to paper that I have ever written. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, can you tell us uh, what motivated you and when did you join, uh, to join, and then when did you join IBM? Yes, I joined IBM in uh, 1955 uh, after getting my uh, doctorate at, at Rutgers uh, University. And uh, <clears throat> at the commencement, the, the invited speaker was William Shockley, who had won the Nobel Prize for his contribution to the, uh, to the transistor, <clears throat> and uh, th that, uh, as well as other influences, led me to think that it would be uh, very interesting to, uh, to, uh, to work on new applications of, uh, of physics. Uh, <clears throat> and so I, uh, mm, yeah, so I, I went to IBM, and IBM at that time was was a, um, was the leading computer uh, uh, developing com uh, company, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, and uh, th that year, nineteen fifty five, was one in which there was a tremendous a tremendous. Uh, optimism in the United States. The science was very well supported by the federal government and there was 
Uh, 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 there were jobs galore. I had many offers of jobs. And uh, so I went to IBM because uh, it, um, IBM was the, the, the premier company that was advancing uh, computers. <clears throat> Can you tell us uh, about the range of research subjects you pursued at IBM? Well, yes, they were mostly um, uh, related to the efforts in IBM to uh, improve uh, memory. And the computer memory of the time was based on ferrite cores. <clears throat> and so, um, and I, since I was connected with the, this group involved in that effort, I investigated the uh, band structure of the, of the, uh, and well, and electronic properties of, of the <coughs> ferrite materials which were used in, uh, in, in ferrite core memory. Uh, at the time, of course, it was uh, yeah, interesting to <clears throat> to um, increase the density of of memory, and so the one uh, one approach was to simply replace the ferrite cores with flat magnetic films, which could then be uh, scaled down, and uh, that led me to uh, to work on the physics of of flat magnetic films and uh, and their uh, interactions between films um, and and the dynamics of the uh, magnetic film uh, uh, reversal. <clears throat> oh. In uh, well, and then um, in the year. Um, in the early 70s, right? You, I remember that I joined IBM in 1971, mm -hmm. and I think we met over a discussion about so-called magnetic bubbles. Yes. In 1970, the Bell Telephone Laboratories proposed the magnetic bubble memory, and so... Uh, <clears throat> I got uh, involved in that. I actually led a, uh, a physics group uh, that um, uh, did experiments with uh, magnetic bubbles. And that was actually an exciting time from 1970 to uh, 1980. That was when um, the uh, there was a lot of excitement about a magnetic bubble memory, and uh, I, I derived some equations for the for the dynamics of the domain walls that were that that, that were uh, involved. The uh, <clears throat> the the bubble the word bubble was actually a misnomer because the the magnetic domains were in the form of a cylinder in a very thin uh, garnet film, and the uh, the the cylindrical wall of the of this so-called bubble uh, had uh, properties, uh, dynamical properties, which uh, I investigated, and then the experimentalists uh, did many exciting experiments. And, in which uh, oh, we uh, uh, really had a lot of fun. <clears throat> but one thing that turned out to be quite useful for memory was the, uh, the so-called bubble deflection effect that the, in the domain wall, uh, in the cylindrical domain wall, the, there is the magnetization vector within the interior of that wall and that vector um, <clears throat> lying parallel to the film 
would um, could make a number of twists uh, as if you drew a, a circuit around the uh, the cylinder. And the the uh, behavior of the magnetic domain was sensitive to that to the winding number of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the the if the if the force was applied to the bubble domain to move it, then the it would not move in the direction of the force, but at an angle to it, and that angle depended upon the winding number within the domain wall. So this this uh, property of the um, behavior of the domain based on the winding number was used. <coughs> Uh, in an exploratory uh, magnetic memory called the bubble lattice file. Uh, and by the year 1980, uh, the, the um, uh, IBM, uh, particularly the, uh, the group in, in California at, at the Almaden Laboratory, uh, succeeded in making a so-called bubble lattice file in which the information was encoded in the number of windings in the uh, in the cylinder domain. <clears throat> uh, but that ni year, 1980, was fateful for magnetic bubble memory because by that time the uh, purely uh, electronic DRAM, uh, dynamical random access memory, uh, had achieved extremely high uh, densities and uh, there was uh, <clears throat> no end in sight for how the density of that memory would increase in the future. So the, uh, the efforts uh, with magnetic bubble memory were completely abandoned in, in 1980. Um, so, um, um, at that point I was a little bit, um, uh, well, yes, I, I should say also that, you know, uh, I had thought of the, mag the tunnel magnet, tunnel magneto resistance of a magnetic tunneling junction uh, which could uh, uh, as a useful way of uh, detecting the presence of a magnetic bubble. <clears throat> yeah, that was sort of a side, side benefit of your involvement in uh, bubble memories, right? Because, yes, that's uh, true. Yes. Uh, and uh, and, uh, but very soon after I thought of that, uh, it, the uh, phenomenon was observed by a <clears throat> uh, by Julier working in in France. Uh, but it, it, uh, this, the the tunnel magneto resistance was observed only at very very low temperatures, just a few degrees uh, Kelvin. Uh, but still, uh, I've, I felt that there was really no fundamental reason why this effect should not be observed at room temperature. And if it were, then it would have uh, some very uh, significant applications. Uh, so, uh, however, I did not actually apply for a patent on this effect. And one of the one of the uh, one of my thoughts was that here I had thought of this effect, but there was this young man in in France who not only thought of the effect but actually observed it experimentally, and and I didn't want to be in the position of like of of trying to uh, uh, take his achievement away from him. Uh, but I did. Uh, oh, and that, uh, but another reason was that 
the, uh, at that time, the IBM was rather not very interested in obtaining patents because there was the uh, antitrust action of the federal government uh, that was uh, <clears throat> uh, so IBM w w did not want to appear monopolistic and so it preferred it, so the preference was to simply publish an invention, but not attempt to to patent it. So I so I did uh, publish three invention disclosures <clears throat> uh, based on this uh, phenomenon. <clears throat> it, it seems to me that. Uh you may be selling yourself a little bit short, although I agree that Julier's work was significant. But I think you were the first one to propose using such a tunnel junction as a field sensor. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I think you should not <laughs> be shy about uh, that uh, concept because uh, as we know, uh, today it's commercialized, fully commercialized, right? And uh, yes. it's used in every disk drive uh, yeah. for reading the data, right, in, in those disk drives. So yeah. um, uh, I just want to make sure we, <laughs> we set the record straight about that detail. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, you, you later on, right, uh, at, at IBM still, right, thought of other interesting phenomena. W when did you conceive of the spin transfer effects? Spin transfer effects, and uh, was that while you were still at IBM? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, The, actually, when the when IBM gave up on that, the bubble memory, I was a, rather at a loss for directing myself. <clears throat> uh, but I had some interest in in experimental work being done in Yorktown by Melvin Pomerantz on um, the. Uh, magnetic films, a, a pair of magnetic films that was that was coupled together by a very thin uh, oxide, <clears throat> and so I, uh, I I was interested in the theory of exchange in coupling by exchange. It's this interaction between uh, different uh, electrons. Uh, <clears throat> of a quantum mechanical nature, uh, and so I uh, I worked on the theory of this, and coincidentally, uh, I was invited to uh, to Zurich by Heine Rohr, who had won the Nobel Prize for his uh, scanning tunneling mag uh, microscope. Uh, he wanted to make it um, sensitive to magnetic phenomena also. And so, <clears throat> so he invited me there to work on the, uh, on the <clears throat> tunneling magnetoresistance that, could be, that might be observed in the scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, and so, f for those, <clears throat> for those two, from those two stimuli, I, I worked on the th theory of uh, of um, uh, of exchange interaction and also t the tunneling magnetoresistance <clears throat> oh, between two iron films separated by, actually, uh, for the tunneling barrier, I took vacuum instead of any kind of uh, material uh, 
um, for the tunneling barrier. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, so I, I had I, I did that work without any idea that there was such an effect as spin transfer torque, but it was it was just something which I tacked on to this paper. The, the, the paper it talked about the, the energy of coupling between the two magnetic films. That was one object. And the other object was the, the tunneling magneto resistance. <clears throat> and then I thought, well, I worked out the tunneling magneto resistance. What, what would happen if I, uh, to the torque, if I would apply a current flowing through it? And well, then I came out with this um, effect of the spin transfer torque. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was just like an incidental result of this calculation. Uh, the effect turned out to be very, very weak uh, considering the very poor quality of tunneling barriers, t materials for tunneling barriers that were available at that time. And so I, I really dismissed it as being of no particular interest. It was just too much, much too weak uh, to have any, uh, um, to, to even be uh, uh, explored. Can you pin down the time? Uh, when was it you went to Zurich? Uh, that was in the 90s, in the middle of... Uh, or I thought it was 1987, late 80s? In the 90s, I think, 96, 97. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's in your other notes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, oh yes, yeah, so no, you're right. It's in 1987. I was a guest of Heine Rohrer at Zurich. And I think later, right, you, you continue to evolve your thinking about the uh, spin transfer phenomenon and uh, applied those ideas to also to memory, right? Uh, yes. Can yes. you tell now, us more about <coughs> how that evolved? <laughs> yes, and then there, there was something very much lacking in my thinking because... Um, the the uh, the tunneling through a through a barrier, well, the materials, barrier materials were simply of insufficient quality really to do good work with that, and so it would would be natural to say to uh, to inquire about the the um, the sort of effects that would occur if you had a metallic spacer between two ferromagnetic metals and and but in my thinking I was um, I had a negative thought about this because I was aware of the fact that there is when when a metallic spacer is placed between two ferromagnetic metals the there is a uh, a strong static exchange coupling which is uh, so which is propagated by the by the uh, the uh, conduction electrons in the metallic spacer <clears throat> and uh, and this uh, an interesting effect, which had been investigated, uh, was actually um, the the coupling was 
um, a, a periodic function of the of the thickness of that um, metallic spacer, and uh, so I was aware that there were there was this significant mechanical coupling between the, the magnetic moments. And so I, I simply assumed that, well, any sort of a, an effect produced by an electric current would be, surely it would be negligible compared to what is there uh, to, to start with. And, but it was really a very foolish thought on my part because I, uh, previous to that, I had, I had uh, been aware of c coupling between magnetic films through a, uh, a metallic spacer and, uh, and, uh, and his experiments, which, and in particular, if if the <clears throat> this material is prepared in a in a very careless way there there would be no coupling because the the roughness of the interfaces would would kill a, this oscillatory effect <clears throat> uh, and so for for s next seven or nine years i just ignored the possibility that the spin transfer coupling would be a significant effect. And then one day it finally dawned on me that, my goodness, this, this will be a, uh, an important effect. And so, um, so I worked it out and that was when, um, and I noted that, the, that uh, if the scale is very small, the, um, the, uh, this effect would be uh, very significant a for uh, for memory application uh, all right but but a a further twist in this whole story is that <clears throat> I had promoted the idea of of using metallic spacers and yes in fact i i did um, I did an invention in which i it, in which I, um, I, 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 I took the, f for, for writing the information, I considered an electric current passing through a metallic spacer. And then for reading the, infra the information, I, I assumed it would be done with a magnetic tunneling junction, uh, which is in which the spacer is a tunneling barrier. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. But, uh, but as things developed, the, uh, the, there was some amazing work in which very good quality tunneling barriers were created. The uh, tunneling barrier the, using magnesium oxide for the for the barrier material um, was very <clears throat> gave really very good results for uh, the tunneling magneto resistance so the in the end this the the uh, spin transfer through a metallic spacer was uh, of no use because the, the, uh, the uh, much simpler and better functioning memory element consisted of the magnetic tunneling junction itself in which one could do both the writing and the reading by passing occurrence through the tunneling barrier. Now to clarify it, uh, to clarify the matter, uh, you also expected spin transfer to occur if you tunneled across a tunnel barrier, right? Yes. You didn't just expect it in a system with a metallic 
that, space that's space true, space. yeah. You, you expect it in both. I had a, expect, pr 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 predicted it in the tunneling barrier before the, the metallic metal. case. Okay. Yes. But, <clears throat> but uh, simply dismissed it because of the poor quality. So the real uh, dramatic breakthrough for, for memory using uh, the spin transfer was the, uh, the first the theoretical prediction by, um, by Butler and company and another group in, in Britain of, the, of, uh, of tunneling barriers using magnesium oxide and then the experimental achievement of this by independently by um, Shinji Uwasa in Japan and uh, Stuart Parkin at IBM. Yeah, the earlier, the earlier, I think, magnetic tunnel junctions were based on aluminum oxide and titanium oxide, right? And I think some of the early exciting results didn't use the magnesium oxide, right? I think a group at MIT. Uh, yes. Did it with aluminum oxide, right? Yes. And I think that provided yeah. impetus that then <laughs> well, sped yes. up the work that led to the discovery yeah. of the MGO potential. Yeah, right? Yes. So uh, I, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure whether the magnetic tunneling junctions using aluminum oxide whether they found any commercial use as uh, in recording heads. Uh, yeah, the first generation, yes, I was closely involved with those heads. The first generation tunnel barrier heads uh, were based on, uh, I think TDK was the first to release one with aluminum oxide. Okay. And Seagate was, at, uh, within months or weeks of each other, Seagate released one with titanium oxide. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. uh, and then, uh, I, don't, I, I think those oxides were used for the first couple generations. Mm -hmm. And then they, once the MGO results became known, uh, everybody quickly adopted MGO for heads, yep. and I think then that further provided impetus to using the MGO-based junctions for the MRAM yes. work, yes. right? And how did you, did you connect, did you stimulate some MRAM work within IBM uh, while you... Ah, yes, <coughs> yes. Well, all right, as you, as you mentioned, it was uh, work at MIT by, um, I think I've forgotten the gentleman's name, who, who discovered aluminum oxide uh, as a uh, good Mudera, Mudera, right? Mudera, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah, and then in Japan it was Miyazaki who observed it. And they, they, uh, those two results I learned about within one month, I got preprints from both, uh, from both groups. And so I, um, uh, I informed Bill Gallagher <coughs> at IBM in Yorktown Heights about this, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he became very enthusiastic about it because at that time he had been doing work in the Josephson supercomputer and the fabrication <clears throat> that he did together with uh, Irving Ames and other people of the the, uh, the, the superconducting devices. Uh, having had that experience, he was convinced that he could make uh, the arrays of this uh, of the magnetic tunneling junctions for for um, for memory using the aluminum oxide uh, barriers, 
And so, uh, so he immediately started this work up in Yorktown Heights. And in fact, there was a collaboration with a, a German company that sent some of their employees uh, to Yorktown. And, and, uh, and so this work continued for um, a long time. But yes, but in the beginning, the writing was done with the magnetic field caused by an electric current, not, not by the spin transfer. Uh, and, uh, but after some years, <clears throat> as the scale of the, the, those exploratory memories, um, as the density became larger and the, the, the dimensions smaller, then, then the, he did switch to the spin transfer as, uh, as the more effective way of, uh, uh, of doing the writing. Just to backtrack a little bit, uh, can you remind us of the date uh, when you thought of the tunnel junction as a detector for magnetic bubbles or as a sensor? Well, that was in the period, I think, of the, when you were in the bubble, active in the bubble program. Yes. What was the date of your concept? Well, I, I, uh, th uh, the, the, the idea came to me in 1974. Yeah. <clears throat> and then it was uh, two or three years later that I, I wrote up these uh, invention disclosures, which were published in the IBM uh, um, Technical Disclosure Bulletin. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> IBM Technical Disclosure Bulletin, but they were not not really patented. The, we also talked about TDK and Seagate. They shipped their heads in 2004. So. This is an interesting relationship. It took 30 years to commercialize the tunnel junction as a, as a reader. Oh, yes. In this race. You conceived it in 74, and the first generation TMR heads shipped in uh, 2004. Uh, yes. It, it was not an easy technology to commercialize, but we, the industry mastered it in the end. Yes, uh, it's quite, these magnesium oxide barriers are really fantastic. They, the, uh, the perfection in, with which they were fabricated is just amazing. They, uh, they achieved ba <clears throat> uh, useful barriers that were four atomic layers in thickness. It's, it's extraordinary how the precision with which they learn how to make these films. Yes. It's, it's amazing. Now, uh, did you follow through with the MRAM application ideas uh, with companies other than IBM? I, th I think you were involved in working with other firms that were trying to commercialize MRAM, right? Uh, well, I, I didn't uh, work with other firms, but uh, you know, I had some contact with the Everspin company, uh, or, or more, uh, oh, there's another one, uh, oh, I can't think of the name, you know. <coughs> Grandis, was it? Perhaps? Yeah, Grandis, yes, yes. I had some contact with the Grandis company. Um, uh, well, before long, there were many players in this, uh, in this sort of work. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but then a really big push. Well, yes, I, I would say the history of it was that the, uh, there was a, um, a large semiconductor fabrication company, I can't remember its name, uh, in which um, uh, one group... Was, was it Motorola, perhaps? Because Motorola at one time made a big push for MRAM, and then they spun off 
Ah, uh, yeah, well, okay, so perhaps that's the one because that's a spun off ever spin. Right. The, uh, yes, this company, probably Motorola, had one division uh, which worked on, on magnetic memory. Uh, and, but after two years, they were spun off into Everspin, and it's, then it became an independent com company. <clears throat> and, uh, and so they, they uh, made memories in which the magnetization was parallel to the plane of the, of the layers. Uh, but uh, then later they switched to the perpendicular mode because they, they could achieve higher densities of um, uh, higher density memory that way. <clears throat> and so they were the, the, the leaders the, that, that uh, actually marketed the, the memories. I recall you mentioning that uh, in our private discussions that Everspin shipped uh, uh, a 64 megabit chip in 2012. Uh, I don't know if you mm -hmm. that that refreshes your memory, and and I guess maybe you could clarify for the future. Uh, what motivated, why did people get so excited about spin transfer versus the original ideas of using conductors with currents in them to switch films? Uh, yeah, because the early MRAM right ideas always used sure. currents through wires, right? To switch through the thin film conductors. Uh, what drove people to be excited about spin transfer versus continuing well, to use yes. uh, currents? <clears throat> Yeah, yes, it was the uh, the idea of increasing the density of of memory. The spin transfer could be scaled. Yeah, it's scaled better. The better spin than the yes. traditional uh, original ideas. Yes, so um, um, it, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> the spin transfer could not really. Uh, be used f until the scale g got down to something like the 100 nanometer range uh, because, of course, in spin transfer you have an electric current flowing through it and the magnetic field of that would uh, would uh, well, it 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 would disturb neighboring films, neighboring elements, cells, yeah. neighboring cells, and, uh, and so it was only uh, after the technology of, of the fabrication technology reached the hundred nanometer scale that uh, one could contemplate using the spin transfer. Uh, John, I think later on in time you also thought of a, a, a different way of uh, using uh, spin transfer. Uh, the concept, I think you came up with a concept of using heat assisted yes. spin transfer. Could you describe that and what motivated that thought? Uh, yes. the. Um, <clears throat> You know, one potential problem with the, uh, the standard use of spin transfer for writing information in a magnetic tunneling junction is that the flow of current through the tunnel barrier uh, in time can cause, uh, can damage the barrier. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, well, and, and decrease the lifetime of this uh, this memory. So, <clears throat> by using heat, I want to assist this uh, pr procedure. 
so that it would use less uh, less current. So in the, in this illustration, I have a, I show here two two uh, memory element sites, and um, the. <coughs> The, the, in the conventional way of using a spin transfer for writing, one has a reference magnet which is pinned by the presence of an anti uh, ferromagnet. Uh, and then here is a tunnel barrier, and then the free magnet, which, in which the information is uh, stored, is shown below here. Uh, so if the, an electric current flows through this <coughs> uh, device, the, uh, the direction of the current determines the orientation of the free magnet and <coughs> uh, to write the information. Now this, the f here I show the with the heat flowing th through this gold layer and into the into a, f a, f a ferrite magnetic material lying here uh, below. That. The, the flow of heat through the interface between the gold and the, the ferrite will, <coughs> will, uh, will create a, a spin current. This is now a, a current in which no electricity flows, but the uh, electrons with one direction of spin will flow upward and electrons with the opposite direction of the spin will flow downwards so that there, there is no electric current flowing through this gold, but, <clears throat> but there is a spin current. And so when that spin current impinges on the free magnet, it will, since uh, the spins are oriented in a horizontal direction, they will cause the, the free magnet to magnetize orthogonally to the, to the uh, easy uh, static directions of the, of the uh, free magnet. And so once the magnetization in the free magnet is horizontal, <coughs> then uh, the electric current flowing through the magnetic tunneling junction will, the sign of that current will determine the information state. If the current is, uh, if, the, uh, if the current is flowing uh, um, uh, downward, then the, the, um, the the the, the 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 torque on the free magnet will push the moment downward, and if the current flows in the uh, direction is changed, it, it it will push it in the opposite direction, and the and the the assistance f from the from the heat flow is f from the fact that the, the energy, the static energy of the, of the free magnet is at a maximum in the horizontal direction. So the, the, the electric current only needs to be strong enough to determine whether the moment falls upward or whether it falls downward from this maximum of energy that's in the 
um, in the in the free magnet. Um, so so therefore, the uh, the result is that <clears throat> the the electric current required to write the information is very much smaller, and so this will uh, prevent the damage to the tunnel barrier, and the mm, the magnetic memory will have a uh, a greater lifetime. It could also, I imagine, reduce uh, d disturbance of nearby cells, right? As you reduce the current, that's beneficial not only in enhancing the lifetime, but yes. in reducing intercell yes, interference, the, Yes, that's right? true. That, that will be the case also, yes. Did you patent this idea? Uh, no, I have not uh, patented this yet. Is, mm, uh, I uh, I hope to. Yeah, I just still need to work out some details, and um, and then I will uh, apply for a patent. But you did recently, right? I remember somehow uh, discussing this with you. You did apply for a patent using thermal. Yes, I did, but yes. not this specific idea. Was it more general? It, it was, uh, <clears throat> well, I consider this to be a, a superior idea to, to the, uh, the previous one. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, in that case, I used, I used the heat flow as an alternative to the elect, to the, um, to the electric current driven spin transfer in actually uh, writing the, inf the the ones and zeros. <clears throat> uh, uh, but I, I think that this will be a more useful uh, application of the, the 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 spin current generated by heat flow yeah I think just to make sure I understand I think you originally thought of using the heat flow to do this actual switching yes of these memories and uh, in this case you're modified it to use it as as a switching assistance Yes. That is, uh, you don't eliminate the electrical current altogether, but you yes. reduce it. Yes. In the other case, you wanted to get away with no current. <laughs> well, of course, and then with the, if you try to use the heat to actually uh, switch the, the information state, there is a difficulty that the, it's, it's not so easy to change the direction of the heat flow. Um, <clears throat> so in, in, in this particular invention, the heat only has to flow in, a, in one direction and the force created by the heat or the torque created by the heat flow only has to go in one direction. It, it pushes the moment to the, to the direction in which its energy is at a maximum. Right. Yeah. Right. Has this uh, this phenomenon been demonstrated experimentally? Uh, no. No. Is somebody working on it? Uh, um, well, uh, yes, there is. Um, uh, uh, Arunava Gupta, who is uh, uh, at work, who works at the University of Alabama um, has, has a a contract from the NSF to explore this uh, phenomenon, but he <clears throat> he is a materials expert, and the first problem was to 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 generate a very thin 
high quality ferrite film. And well, and recently he has succeeded in doing that. And uh, the next step of actually uh, having heat flow through it and so on and observe the effect uh, has not yet uh, been performed. Is he uh, part of that uh, group that has been studying uh, magnetic recording uh, yes. phenomena? Yes, there is uh, a group there. Uh, what do they call themselves? MINT, yeah, M-I-N-T. Yes. I don't remember what the, what the letters stand for, but there is a group there which, which studies uh, materials for, um, for memory, yes. I think it's run by, uh, currently it's headed by Professor Takao Suzuki. Uh, yes, he's the Suzuki. Head of that effort. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, I think that covers, right? Uh, did we leave anything uh, significant that, as you, as you recap in your mind, uh, your, your accomplishments and uh, work. Uh, have we missed anything? Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to the uh, accomplishments? No, no I, I don't think there's anything more. You think more you've covered uh, the yes. ones that you wanted to do. Uh, let's, let's maybe switch the tone a little bit. As you now think back about okay. all your <laughs> accomplishments, uh, do, do any incidents stand out uh, uh, that remind you of what were some of the most difficult challenges in making progress in your various projects? Uh, <laughs> are there any vignettes you could share with us? Well, okay, I uh, think one of the biggest... What were the highlights? What were the lowlights, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what gave you the most satisfaction and what gave you the most frustration? Well, yeah. there, there was uh, actually early in my career at IBM, I was made manager of a, a, a theoretical group, which had about a dozen theorists. And... Um, and I was very troubled by this by this responsibility because each of these theorists was working on his own research problem and and had no no connection with any interest in IBM <laughs> and so uh, I didn't. Uh, I I was baffled by that prop that problem, and I didn't understand what what I should do about that. I, I my the the um, my own interest was to look around me and see what was going on in the IBM, and to <clears throat> uh, and to participate in something that would be significant. And so I was puzzled as to what, what to do with the, this group of people. But the solution to my dilemma occurred when, uh, <clears throat> uh, when the bubble memory program, no, I'm sorry. Um, no, the, I, had, I got an opportunity to visit the IBM laboratory in Zurich uh, to spend a year there, and so I, and someone else took over my managerial responsibility, and so I escaped that problem. Uh, um, you escaped it through the back door. <laughs> yes. What did you after that? You you came back from Zurich and you resumed your individual work. Uh, you didn't have to manage a group. Well, I, that's when the magnetic bubble program came along, and I was um, uh, I was assigned to manage that uh, effort, and uh, so and that worked out very well because w there was an active uh, device group that was making magnetic bubble memory. There were f 
problems in the physics of, involved. Uh, uh, there were experimentalists that were doing experiments with the magnetic bubbles and you know, theoretical questions about it. Uh, you know, so there was like a whole um, uh, there was a. Uh, I, I can't. Well, it's a whole context for your work, right? Yeah, was, was, this was a yes. highly applied effort. Yes. Trying to develop yeah. a breakthrough in uh, computer memories, right? Yes. I, so I don't that, know how you could get more applied than that. <laughs> yes. In a so the, like those that, yeah. next 10 years were really very delightful years of research at IBM. and um, uh, but. And, <clears throat> At the end of the 10 years, in 1980, when DRAM uh, completely uh, demolished any interest in magnetic memory, well, of course, the, uh, magnetic memory has the, me has the advantage of being non-volatile. Uh, today, that's regarded as quite significant. But back in those days, there was no worry about uh, consumption of heat in computers, and so, uh, or cons consumption of energy, uh, so the uh, the fact the non volatility was uh, a trivial thing compared to the uh, magnificent density that DRAM was able to achieve. <clears throat> But clearly, you were excited about that period of magnetic bubble memory work, uh, related work. But uh, which which do you consider your most significant successes or success in your work? Well, surely it's this the spin transfer effect, and it's yeah, and it's rather interesting that all right during. The, the, my early years there, let's say my first 20 years at IBM, uh, I was conscious of these different application problems and what I could, and the, the work that was being done in, in magnetic memory. And so uh, I could focus on that. Now, but when the magnetic bubble project faded out in 1980, and uh, <clears throat> I was kind of at a loss as to what to do. And the, and the weird thing is that the really most significant thing I did was the spin transfer. It was at a time when I had given up on magnetic memory, and, uh, but somehow <laughs> this uh, great idea came about. Um, it, even though I was, you know, adrift. Oh, and then there, there was, yes, and it was really, there, there was a dramatic aspect to that because there was, um, uh, in, I'm, I'm losing track of time, but the, there was one year when um, IBM s suffered a tremendous loss something, some $8 billion loss, uh, and uh, I had to cut, cut its staff, and um, my manager thought that I was an ideal candidate to retire, but <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> and uh, it was, so four levels of my management at, uh, in Yorktown said that I should, I should retire. But uh, the director of the uh, mm, uh, the technical director of the storage division saved my job for me, and it was only the year or two after that that I th I thought of the spin transfer idea. <laughs> so, so the that extra several years in my career was. Uh, uh, gave me the opportunity to do my best work. Very nice. Uh, who were uh, some of the people you most admire 
in your career and, and why? Could you oh, share yeah. this with us? Well, I'm, uh, the, the two people I most admired there were uh, uh, Ralph Landauer, yeah, and um, and uh, Jonathan Sun. Well, and R Ralph Landauer, to me, was really a, a, a sensational person. He was a theoretical physicist who was uh, really very, uh, very creative in his own uh, research work. But when he came to IBM, actually, a couple of years before I did, uh, he was aware of the fact that IBM was at a crucial point in its progress as a company because up to that time, the, the, the machines were all electromechanical. They were, and they used vacuum tubes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> But Ralph understood that uh, w that that uh, that the that was an you know an outdated way of 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 doing uh, um, that it was that the the future was in in. Integrated circuits uh, uh, using replacing vacuum tubes with with transistors and and uh, that sort of thing. And so here he was. He was a theoretical physicist, but he he looked around and he and he uh, you know he had a grasp of the big picture, and then he pushed. People, he, well, in his with his personality, you know, with his uh, by urging people and and uh, facing up to the problems required to make this this big uh, shift in uh, in IBM effort, uh, and then uh, <clears throat> and which of course ended up very satisfactorily because for the next twenty years IBM was by far the most uh, productive uh, company in the uh, uh, working in the computer wor world, uh, and then on the other hand, he was also a great theoretical physicist. He he wrote uh, very interesting papers on the uh, on transport in um, uh, electrical transport in. In uh, materials, uh, for which are v very highly respected. <clears throat> so, and then the other very uh, the person I admire is uh, Jonathan's son, who was um, uh, had been my uh, experimental collaborator, and uh, and he was again a very or is, well, he's still active today. He is a very, uh, very active person who, 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 uh, who masters all aspects of, of his work. I mean, he, he, he can do, he's done theoretical papers on, on magnetic memory related stuff. And uh, conducted experiments uh, using all sorts of different instruments, and uh, he, he just—it's um, this kind of breadth of attitude, and you know, not simply making himself a specialist in one thing, and and uh, but. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, learning what needs to be done, and and uh, learning the techniques, and uh, to uh, 
required to uh, uh, to attack all aspects of the uh, uh, of the research problems. He collaborated with you at IBM. He's, he's or uh, at IBM. Yes. He's still working with IBM. Yes, uh, he's okay. still working there. Yes. Nice. Yes. Yes. Well, you're now retired. From IBM, or yes. you're still working there? No, I retired in the year 2002. So wow. that's how many years <laughs> I've been retired for a long time. You know, well, of course, for several years, even after retirement, I, I did, uh, you know, I was an emeritus there. We had, IBM did have a, a, a kind of a emeritus program, uh, but uh, but, but it's been now uh, many years since I have actually uh, been working on the premises there. But you're still active, uh, continue to advance your work. Uh, that's my perception. <laughs> yes, I do. I am active, but uh, my rate of progress is rather slow, I must say. I'm not, uh, could you share wi with us the uh, any special honors and awards you received in oh. recognition of your contributions? Yeah. Well, okay. The first award I got was is for this at IBM. I received an award for the a bubble lattice file, which, as I had explained earlier, was. Uh, <clears throat> made use of physical ideas that I had uh, thought of. And, and then the, uh, uh, there was the IUPAP award. Mm. Uh, I think it's, uh, that inc also includes a nail medal in magnetism. Yes. That's yes. that award. Yes, that I was a the, yeah, the IUPAP prize for research in magnetism. Yes, and Nail Medal. Mm -hmm. And I think you're, uh, are you a member of the IEEE? Yes, I am. Did yes. they uh, think well yes. of your work? Yes, I, they, uh, I re did receive an IEEE award for, uh, for this uh, spin transfer work. And then, uh, and then the American Physical Society uh, awarded me the Buckley uh, Prize for um, for uh, for the spin transfer um, achievement. Yes. And the work you're pursuing now is to advance the spin transfer. The development of the advanced spin transfer ideas. Well, yes. Uh, so I, uh, I, I am most interested in this heat-driven spin transfer. <clears throat> uh, could you share with us your outlook for the future of data storage uh, in memory? Well, my own outlook is uh, not very well informed because I'm. Uh, in my retirement, I've um, the intensity of my um, uh, of my uh, uh, <clears throat> associations with uh, people with with advances that are taking place. It's uh, the intensity is rather low, so my own ideas are are bound to be uh, kind of naive, and I simply accept the some of the things I read about that um, that uh, magnetic memory, um, the the spin transfer magnetic memory uh, is it is of course non-volatile, and uh, it can be embedded onto. Uh, to semiconductor chips. So I've never understood why DRAM could not be embedded, but the magnetic memory can be embedded, <laughs> which is 
DRAM, of course, being um, purely electronic itself. Uh, so I, uh, <clears throat> so it, it it can be embedded, and the, and the fact that it's that it is non-volatile means that it combines the memory, the the requirement that memory has to be has to interact with the central processing unit in a very intimate way, uh, and it combines that aspect with the long-term storage. So, um, it, um, so, so the, this is, uh, is an advantage that um, that that uh, the spin transfer memory will have in the future. Uh, in my reading of 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 the popular literature on the, these matters, I I uh, I'm informed that there are something like eight different non-volatile memory alt technical approaches, and uh, no one can. No one can reliably predict which one will be the dominant one, uh, let's say, 10 years from now. Uh, but um, the spin transfer memory is, is among the contenders. Interesting to see how this develops right uh, in the future. Uh, what, uh, with your background and uh, uh, excellent experience, what advice would you give to a young person starting out their career in, in technology, yeah, I'm, physics, I'm a, or engineering? My, 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 uh, my advice is nothing very unique. Is you know, study hard and, <laughs> and uh, don't get too involved in digital things. Um, but but I'm a very poor person to advise, to provide the, this sort of advice because when I started in in my career, the all doors were open. I mean, in the fifties, it was just a few years after the end of World War Two. Uh, the United States was the, was the only part of the world that had an intact manufacturing uh, establishment. Uh, you know, there had been so much destruction in other countries. Mm. So, uh, the, the, the uh, well, it was a period of tremendous optimism and, uh, and uh, no problem about going through college and you know my my simple thought was that I'm uh, in my experience I did not have to face these problems that that uh, that ambitious students have today of um, the enormous debts they accumulate uh, the enormous d debts yes yeah uh, it was you know, my father uh, was a salaried person, and was in those days a salaried person could put aside enough money to send his his children to college without saddling them with a debt. And today, it's 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 atrocious when I learn of some uh, someone graduating and then owing a half a million dollars for his education and having difficulty finding a job. You know, so I'm afraid I cannot uh, uh, Re reconcile that, <laughs> yourself with that situation. Yes, yes, exactly. But I think you're saying if you're going to study, study the fundamentals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, John, I think uh, this ends the questions I had. Is there anything else uh, that you wanted to cover in your uh, interview? Anything that we may have missed? Um, no, I, I can't think of anything more.
No. Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to do this interview, and uh, I wish you all the best in your continued pursuit of uh, uh, advanced magnetic phenomena. <laughs> well, thank Ho you. <laughs> hopefully, spin transfer is not the last one you tackle. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the the chance of uh, exposing my thoughts in this way. It's a pleasure.